welcome, hello. Hello, hello, welcome, welcome. It is with great pleasure that we welcome uh, everyone to Pandas Presbyterian. Thank you for coming. Uh, before we start, just to let you know, we have the bathrooms are in the back, and then also we have bathrooms outside towards the end of the hall, the cement end of the hall to the right. But we have bathrooms here as well. Um, we also have some coffee outside, um, and I think if you have some coffee here, we just ask to be please mindful with lids just so that no spillage occurs. Um, but again, welcome. Thank you so much for coming. We're so excited to have you guys here and to have Ms. Rosario Butterfield here blessing us with what's going to be, I'm sure, very convicting <laughs> and encouraging word. Uh, we're going to start with some um, worship um, and then to prepare ourselves and let's just open up in prayer. Uh, Father God, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you uh, for being loving and merciful um, through, through and through God. Um, we pray that you're with us today. Um, we pray that you're with uh, Rosaria as she speaks and open our hearts, God, more than what you've already done that you continue to do and, um, and for sanctifying us um, and allowing opportunities like this for, uh, for our sanctification. Uh, we love you, we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
the great honor and privilege of um, introducing our speaker. Um, Rosara Butterfield is a renowned author and speaker. She's a former tenured professor of English and women's study at Syracuse University, converted to Christ in 1989 in what was described as a train wreck. Her words, not mine. <laughs> um, her memoir, The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert, chronicles that difficult journey. She's also known for her convicting and encouraging book, which a lot of us uh, have read, The Gospel Comes with a House Key. 
And Rosaria is married to Pastor Kent, a Reformed Presbyterian pastor in North Carolina, is a homeschool mother, an author, a speaker, and a wonderful sister in Christ. Uh, so please help me welcome Rosaria Butterfield. Oh, thank you so much. I send greetings from my home church, uh, where my husband pastors, First Reformed Presbyterian Church of Durham. I'm very happy to be with you today, and I'm speaking to you today from a new book, a book that's coming out in September, and it's called The Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age. So imagine with me this scene. There's a woman, maybe it's you, maybe it's your mom, maybe it's your sister, uh, maybe it's your daughter. Um, let's go with sister, just keep it consistent. Uh, she tells you a story about something that happened to her yesterday when she went to the big warehouse grocery store, Costco or Sam's Club, with her two youngest daughters. As soon as she left the house, she heard screaming, bigot, hater. These were the words that greeted her as she pushed the stroller down the sidewalk. She looked around, wondering who was shouting these accusations and to whom. And in utter disbelief, she realized that the shouter was a brother in the Lord from the church that she used to attend. And he was angrily shouting at her. He was wearing a t-shirt with a genderqueer flag, you know, the one with the purple lavender stripe. And all around her, people were arguing with fingers pointed and accusations flying hard. It was frightening and confusing. She knew each of these people by name and would have, before this encounter, called them brothers and sisters in the Lord. Seemingly overnight, a civil war had broken out within the visible Christian church. She arrived at Costco emotionally exhausted. She hoisted her two little daughters in the grocery cart seat, handed each one a snack cup with Cheerios, pulled out her membership card, and flashed it to the check-in girl. Thank you, miss, she said politely, while entering the colossal warehouse through the electronic section, where mountainous TV screens covered the walls. On one screen, she witnessed a news reporter shoving a microphone under a beleaguered mom's chin while posing a cheeky question in what seemed to be an alien language. The reporter appeared to speak English, but used phrases like intersectionality and gay Christianity, and declared Christians who dead name transgendered people to be committing genocide. And at this point, your sister realized that the check-in girl was trying to get her attention, and so she searched her pocketbook, thinking maybe she dropped her membership card, and you know, the check-in girl was kindly trying to return it. But that wasn't the problem. The check-in girl was shaking her fists in rage. I go by the pronouns he and him, the girl shouted over the din of the TVs. Your heteronormativity abuses me. Her face was contorted with anger. What is heteronormativity, your sister wondered. As if she read your sister's mind, the news reporter on the big TV spoke directly to the camera. We are on a full-scale full war against heteronormativity, the horrific belief that heterosexuality is normal. Your sister smiled at her daughters, trying to draw their attention away from the blaring TV. She pondered the word heteronormativity as she esteemed her daughter's dark brown eyes, something they inherited from her husband. Your sister tried to understand what is not normal about a husband and a wife and the children God graciously gives to them. What kind of culture goes to war against this? Your sister hurried past the news station because her daughter spotted blues clues on the next big, big screen and wanted to get out of the cart and dance and sing along. But something seemed off as they drew near, and that's when she noticed it. The show's title was Blues Clues Pride Parade Sing Along, featuring Nina West. I'm not kidding, and we can show you clips later if you don't believe me, but. 
No, not kidding. In fact, she sent you the YouTube clip and asked you to help her interpret it. Your sister had no idea that the pl fluffy blue dog beloved by preschoolers everywhere now hung out with drag queens. The children were, of course, spellbound. Rushing past RuPaul's protege at full tilt, your sister found herself at the foot of another gay performance, the San Francisco Gay Men's Choir performing, performing a message from the gay community, we are coming for your children. This was how quote unquote Pride Month, or some of us like to call it uh, Genesis Awareness Month was launched last year. We can send you that clip too. I'm trying to be sensitive to the fact that we have children in the audience, but this is the world we live in. So this one really took you aback. Its haunting refrain is, will convert your children. And that seemed to be ominously and threatening prophetic. The lead tenor with his foppish eyebrows and sinister smirk signaled that, well, yes, he really is coming for your children. And as the other members of this large and talented choir combined voices for the crescendo, your sister realized that she was the one now spellbound. She was truly shocked that gay men parody so openly today about pedophilia. Because back in ancient history, like five years ago, that would have hit a little close to home, and it would have been unthinkable. Your sister was visibly shaken by this experience, so she also texted you the YouTube links to her sister and a few of her friends from small group. She was even more taken aback when each woman rebuked her for her homophobia and told her that gay people are made in the image of God and should be recognized as the modern biblical equivalent of Gentiles coming into the kingdom. One woman from her small group even quoted Joe Biden's comments recently at the White House ceremony honoring March 33, 2023 as the National Day of Transgender Visibility. This was four days after the horrific uh, shooting at a PCA church in Nashville. President Biden said, quote, on Transgender Day of Visibility, we want you to know that we see you just as you are, made in the image of God and deserving of dignity, respect, and support. Your sister wants to know if you believe this too. She wants to know if there really is a national day called Transgender Day of Visibility, because that kind of snuck up on her. She was busy having babies. Um, she said she expected Christians to be in conflict with the world, but not with each other. And why, she is asking you, are these conflicts dividing the church? Your sister has asked you a basic, and a basic question about what sometimes we call cultural apologetics or the reasonableness of the Christian faith or the relationship between faith and reason. Those are the three ways that we would categorize this question for an audience or a book. And it goes something like this. If my enemies are Christ's enemies, and if Christ is not divided, then why are enemy lines drawn within Christianity, especially on issues that the Bible speaks clearly about, like homosexuality, and feminism, and paganism, and transgenderism, the inherent and ontological difference between men and women. We will answer this question in the course of this talk, and I answer it even more fully in this forthcoming book. But first, I want, you to, I want to give you a little backstory. I was converted to faith in Jesus Christ about 25 years ago, when I was an associate professor of English, women's studies, and queer theory at Syracuse University. I was in a lesbian relationship with a woman who was an adjunct professor of psychology at a nearby university. And at that point, I had been in and out of serially monogamous lesbian relationships for a decade and had been a gay rights activist for about two decades. My most popular classes at Syracuse were in feminist queer theory, which focused on the worldviews of Freud, Hegel, Marx, and Darwin. I co-authored the university's domestic partnership policy, which served as bellwether and archetype for gay marriage activism. 
I spoke at New York gay pride rallies and met famous gay rights activists. I hated the Bible and its teaching, and I taught thousands of college students to do the same. I proudly became one of the tenured radicals who worked laboriously to make homosexuality look wholesome. And I did all of this because I believed with my whole heart that I was gay and that gay is good. I helped create the evil in this world. The blood is on my hands. My conversion to Christ came with the loving offense of the gospel, shared over hundreds of nourishing meals at a Christian neighbor and pastor's house. After two years of meals and having read the Bible through seven times, I committed my life to Jesus. I broke up with my lesbian partner and I started to grow out my butch haircut. How Jesus was going to deal with my persistent lesbian feelings, not to mention the fact that I was tenured in queer theory. I used to tell people, I'm not just a sinner, I'm tenured in it. That was really a big mystery to me. But the gospel, a singular clarion call, a cleft of light and a cavern of darkness destroyed me and beckoned me all at the same time. I knew the gospel and the resurrection of Jesus was true, objectively true, and it would be true whether I believed it or not. The truth of Christ was a truth over which I, the English professor, had no interpretive power. When I committed my life to Jesus, I realized three things. One, Jesus was true and alive. Two, gay was how I was for now, but not who I was eternally. And three, the same God who made the mountains and told them where to stand now reigned over my feelings and the affections of my heart. My conversion was messy and dangerous. I lost friends and cultural capital. I did not lose my job, but I did have to go before an ethics board to explain why I was no longer willing to teach queer theory or feminist studies. Of my large gay community, an even larger university one, no one else came to Christ that I know of. I was mocked and despised by the people I loved, but one thing was clear. I was once God's enemy, but now was God's friend. I learned to repent of my sin at its root, I learned that repentance is the threshold to a holy God and a lifeline of Christian fruit. To say that those early years were rough on me is gothic underestimation. <laughs> and it was clear that I was not the only one with problems caused by my conversion to Christ. Imagine coming from Syracuse, coming to Syracuse from Australia to work as one of my doctoral students in queer theory only to realize that before your plane lands, the trustworthy queer theory prof has committed her life to Jesus. All of my former students, colleagues, and lovers felt sold out, and their feelings were accurate. Not able to obey two masters, I betrayed the people I loved. I share this with you, not to scare you, although I realize that does sometimes scare you, but I share this with you because although the Lord graciously saved me, he didn't lobotomize me and I'm not quite old enough to have dementia. I have spent a quarter century pondering the questions I am posing in this book and I'm posing in this lecture. I have looked at them from every side I know of, the LGBTQ plus side, the new convert side, um, the grieving Christian parent side, and the faithful church's side. And from the best of my ability to think and write and read, I have arrived at an explanation as to why the world is in chaos and why the church is divided. And it comes down to three reasons and five lies. Here are the three reasons. Number one, we have failed to see that the seeds of the gospel are in the garden. There's no gospel without the garden. 
There's no gospel without the creation ordinance. That's Genesis 127. Two, we have failed to read the times. Luke 12, 56. And three, we have failed to love our enemies well enough to tell them the truth. Luke 6, 26. Matthew 5, 11 through 12. Number one, we have failed to see that the seeds of the gospel are in the garden. We foolishly believed in the evangelical world that we could reinvent our calling as men and women, render men and women interchangeable, defy God's pattern and purpose for the sexes, and somehow reap God's blessings. God's plan for men and women, the creation ordinance, is first found in Genesis 1, and it is central not peripheral to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over every living thing that moves on the earth. The creation ordinance not only describes how men and women are created distinctly and by God's design, it defines what it means to be human. To be human means to reflect God's image as a man or as a woman. And we are made in God's image, not as Joe Biden and our gay, gay rights activists believe. We're not made as God's image. That prepositional difference is key. The creation ordinance declares that mankind is made in God's image, not as it. The image of God is not found in the flesh of our human body. For God is a most pure spirit, invisible without body, parts, or passions, Westminster Confession of Faith 2.1. This means that as striking as the Sistine Chapel is, the image of God is not found on its ceiling in Michelangelo's artistry. It's not there. That's just beautiful paganism. To reflect God's image, we need to look at him through the mirror of the word of God illuminated through the Holy Spirit. When gay rights activists who self-identify as Christian or the president of the United States speaking at the most outrageous thing I've ever heard, the Transgender Day of Visibility, four days after a quote-unquote trans person gunned down children and teachers at the Covenant Presbyterian Church of Nashville, when they say things like, gay people are made in the image of God and God doesn't make mistakes, they are saying that God makes people gay, and that gayness, or trans, or whatever you want to fill in there, reflects God's creational design. No way. The Bible records that the sin of homosexuality, or transgenderism, comes from the world, the flesh, and the devil, not from image-bearing of a holy God, Ephesians 4.24 and Colossians 3.10. To, to grow in the image of God... Sin must be mortified or killed, not stewarded for good. We don't slap a pride sticker on it and give you a parade. We help you learn how to put a fresh nail through your choice sin every day, preferably first thing in the morning before you take your first sip of coffee. We teach you the fine and mature art of Christian living to hate your sin without hating yourself. Joel Beakey writes, when men fell into sin, knowledge gave way to ignorance, righteousness to iniquity, and holiness to ungodliness. 1 John 1, 9 through 10 reminds us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have, sinned, we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. The job of every Christian, truly, is to hate your sin without hating yourself. And I think as I'm seeing a lot of people nod as I'm speaking, you know that took some time. That wasn't the first thing you learned how to do as a Christian. 
Only liars dress their sin in cloaks of moral goodness or wolves. We are image bearer as male or female. We are made in the image of God as distinctly men or distinctly women, and we are called to reflect that image in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness as men and as women. Some aspects of gospel life are universal to both men and women. For example, we are all called to repent of our sin and put our hope in Christ and live obediently. But because our creational design and purpose is different, some aspects of obedience are different too. Wives are called to obey their husbands in the Lord. Qualified men only are called to be pastors and elders in the church. Brothers and sisters in the Lord show their love to one another by not leading each other into temptation, which means women are to conduct themselves with modesty, and brothers are to protect their sisters' reputations. When we level creational differences between men and women, foolishly thinking that there is no vital difference, we disobey God. The rancor and disunity within the evangelical church reflects God cutting down to size the tower of gender and sexual confusion that we have foolishly built. And not only have we foolishly built it up, but well-known parachurch ministries want you to think that leveling the differences between men and women and making men and women interchangeable is missional, evangelical, or even the urban church center church movement. Flee the wolves, sisters. Flee the wolves. Number two, we have failed to read the times. We are divided because false teaching and timid teaching have crept into the church. People have exchanged the truth for lies of the hopes of getting along well with the world. And these lies have been codified into the law of the land. Yes, I know the gospel is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Yes, I know God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. But to pretend that today is the same as yesterday, today, and tomorrow is foolishness. And it means you can't deal in reality. Christian women, you need to have your feet on the floor and your eyes wide open. The Apostle Paul describes how people start to believe their own lies by outlining the three exchanges of Romans 1. And that's from really, there are three times that the word exchange comes up, and it's in Romans 1, 21 to 26. I'm going to break this down. The first is the exchange of the creator for the creature and the exchange of God worship for idol worship. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. There is a binary opposition between God the creator and man the creature. And true worship respects that binary. The Christian faith is binary, not non-binary. In all ways. That, th those terms binary and non-binary were philosophy terms before they became anything else. Number two is the exchange of truth for lies. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. God's truth found in God's word knows our hearts better than we do. And I'm going to say that again. The Bible knows you better than you know yourself. When the word of God crosses us at the level of our heart's desire, we must follow the Bible's teachings. Our life is on the line. And sisters, if when you read the Bible this morning and it didn't cross you, that's a problem. The Bible should be crossing you. And by crossing, I mean setting up that boundary, telling you, yes, I know you want to go this way, but you need to go that way. 
If it's not doing that, you need to pray that the Lord would give you an edgier relationship to the Word of God. It is our lifeline right now. It is like we are living at the ground zero of the Tower of Babel. Number three, the exchange of a natural, life-giving sexuality. You know, back in ancient history, we used to call that heterosexuality until that became a bad word. You notice the LGBTQ+, plus, there's no H in there. The only thing you can be in the alphabet soup people is be an ally to the alphabet soup people. And I say that as somebody who used to be an alphabet soup person, right? So nobody's going to be angrier than somebody who escaped. It's like a Jude 23 moment, right? <laughs> but if the... If the fireman comes in and, and he, uh, he uh, saves you through the fire, you don't sue him because he broke your ribs in the process. God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Homosexuality is not a normal sexual variant, but rather a judgment of God against a people and a nation. A nation that is growing in its homosexuality and transgenderism is being judged by God. Now, these exchanges also have a tragic order, idolatry, the exchange of the triune God for gods of our own making, lies, the exchange of truth for lies, and perversion and barrenness, the exchange of the natural heterosexuality for the unnatural homosexuality. The meaning of homosexuality in the context of culture and civilization far exceeds any of the, what I've talked about, and I understand that. For example, when I called myself gay, this was not how I understood the picture. I did not see this. But I want you to know, everybody would be better off if they did understand this. This is a cultural apologetics lesson. And even your gay rights activist uh, neighbors would be brighter off if they understood, because we are in a place of danger. And I'm gonna tell you why in a little bit. And a thinking Christian now needs to take a full stop. Why have we, and I'm, I'm using this we, I think we've all done this, why have we not focused on the biblical mandate in Romans 1, and instead we have preferred to hear experiences of people's stories of being gay? Um, we, why, I'm just, it's, it's a question. Why have we privileged the experience of people who love their sin over the faithful words of scripture. I have probably undergone thousands of interviews, and the first question is never what does the Bible say, but how did you feel? Why have we fallen for the ruse, and myself included, I'm not, I'm not exempting myself, that Gnostic personal experience, okay, Gnosticism was a philosophy that said, if you really want to understand something, go find, go find a native, okay? And get that person to tell you what it feels like because that person has special wisdom, special insight. Go find that person and that person will explain it. So that's what Gnosticism means. And so why have we fallen for the ruse that Gnostic personal experience provides a special insight and insider knowledge that God doesn't already have. Now, I'm not saying you should be a jerk or never listen to people and their stories. You need to do that. I'm just saying, why did we privilege it? Why did we say that was the true truth? And the Bible, well, it just doesn't understand. Why have we participated in the heresy that says we need to help people navigate their homosexuality or their transgenderism. That's a line right from Preston Sprinkle. I'll name some other names in this lecture because I'm tired of it. So I'm naming names. And you know it's funny, because I've been doing this for about 10 years, and all I hear from these jokers is silence. I, 
it's like they don't, we used, we used to share, you know, green rooms together at big conferences. I know they know how to find me. The broad evangelical church has been reluctant to face the facts and even more reluctant to bring the word of God boldly to bear on these facts in our post-Christian world. Perhaps they fear hurting the feelings of the person I used to be. Perhaps they fear being called a bigot and a hater. But either way, facts must be faced. And the facts I want to talk about now go by two names two Supreme Court cases. The first is Obergefell, 2015, and the second is Bostock, 2020. In June of 2015, the Supreme Court of the United States redefined marriage in a landmark case, Obergefell versus Hodges, by executive fiat. That means the states weren't involved. Your Supreme Court just gave you the, like, the benediction Gay marriage became the law of the land. The court did not expand the definition of a marriage to include gay people. That's what they said they were going to do, but something else happened. The court declared opposition to gay marriage a discriminatory act of animus or hatred. And they did that by including a special clause at the end called the Dignitary Harm Clause. I'll tell you about that in a bit. But then next, the court declared in 2020, in a case, Bostock versus Clayton, that denying LGBTQ plus rights represents an attack on the human dignity of all people who use the letters LGBTQ and the symbol plus. Bostock said that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 must include LGBTQ plus. And the plus sign isn't an unimportant thing. A plus sign means we don't know how many letters are there. I mean, right now, there are 72 different gender identities. I'm not a math major. I'm just an English professor. But I will tell you, if your identity is letter-based, and you need 72, and you have an alphabet with 26, you know, you're just in a bad way. Okay, you're just, and I, okay, I'll keep my snark for the very end. <laughs> very end. So, um, this is a bogus claim, but upon the backs of it, the court introduced the idea of dignitary harm, which says that denying someone's dignity as an LGBTQ plus person is an act of violence and oppression. So when I was a lesbian, I would get mad if you denied me my rights because I wanted to buy a pizza, and you said, I don't sell pizzas to gays, and I want my pizza, and my lack of pizza was a material good that I felt wanting. Today, if you don't use pronouns, you don't put the flag up, you don't bow to the emperor, you are denying someone's dignity you are violating the Dignitary Harm Clause. Apparently, hurting my feelings is the same thing as breaking my arm. Another way that you might deny someone's LGBTQ dignity, however, is to give a public lecture like this one, or to write the book like the book I have coming out. You see what I am doing, the world calls hate speech, and it may or may not be illegal. We will see. You know, the church has always been on a collision course with the idea that homosexual orientation is a true measure of man. And in Obergefell and Bostock, the collision made impact. The world now believes that there is such a thing as an LGBTQ plus person. The broad evangelical church and parachurch ministries that make winsomeness the goal and not the means, they nod and smile along with this notion fanning the flames of the gospel of pluralism. And so we must ask a question. Is it true? Is there such a thing as a gay person? Was I a gay person? Is this a matter of personhood, which is ontological, Genesis 127, image bearing, or is it a matter of practice? If you're an English major, you'll like this next one. Is it a noun or a verb? 
Is there really such a thing as an LGBTQ plus person? The answer is no. No. Uh, there's, there's gay sex, there's the gay culture, there's gay sin, there's not gay personhood. By the early 20th century, homosexual orientation became a category of personhood and replaced the biblical measure of man found in Genesis. And after a Obergefell and Bostock, LGBTQ plus describes who someone is ontologically rather than how someone feels phenomenologically. Ontology is the study of being. Phenomenology is the study of consciousness. Freudian ideas about sexuality have now become the religion of our land. And if the Lord Jesus Christ tarries and we carry on for a few more hundred years, I am confident that historians will look back on our day and, and the only likely comparison will be living during the days of child sacrifice to the idol Moloch. We are barbarians. The biblical witness of the creation ordinance provides a radically different definition of what it means to be a person than what Freud and the world offer. Under scripture, you are rooted in bearing the image of God. You are male and female image bearers of a holy God with specific responsibilities and blessings accruing from God's sexual design. But according to the fount of LGBTQ plus ideology, because your feelings are the fountain of truth, you are gay if you say so. Freud was a product of German romanticism, a worldview that proffered subjective epistemology. You are gay if you say so, you are trans if you say so, you're even a dragon if you say so. Currently there is a six-year-old self-identified girl trapped in the body of a 53-year-old man in the UK and he has sponsors. Um, he also has a wife and children that he's completely neglected. So I don't make this stuff up. So who's the victim in this last example? The man who abnegated his responsibilities to his wife and children so he could follow an infantilized fetish? Or the wife and children he abandoned? See, the LGBTQ movement does produce victims. It's just not the dudes in skirts. Amen. When the evangelical church embraced LGBTQ plus ideology, and it did it by being soft, it did it by being winsome, it did it by not wanting to, to really believe that the, what, 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 what the reformers called the perspicuity of, 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 the, of the scriptures, the clarity of the scriptures, we were somehow told it wasn't quite as clear as we thought it was. But when the evangelical church embraced LGBTQ plus ideology, the true gospel was exchanged for a false one. And ironically, this made the world much less safe for people like the person I used to be. I mean, it's not even a joke, but I field a lot of questions from people trying to get out of the LGBTQ evangelical machine. I feel like I'm running a little underground railroad, you know, in between my hospitality ministry and practicing, you know, teaching my children. It's, it's telling people lies hurts them. It hurts them. And it has made this world much less safe for the person I used to be. A genuine Christian who experiences the indwelling sin of homosexual desire or transgenderism will find both the world that says, do it feels good, and the church that says, hey, you're a sexual minority. You need a voice and a platform in the church. Let's bring revoice to us. Those are both equally dangerous. Where is it safe to repent of our sin and be built up in the promises of God? Where is it safe to repent of my sin and flee and no longer be gay or trans? That's actually the gospel. But we've been told that that's not fair. Jesus liberates the captives. I'm one of them. Praise be to God that when I was studying scripture, I, you know, I didn't have some of these nutcases for pastors. Afraid, cowards. Quite frankly, I think they should all just start selling insurance. <laughs> I really do. I mean, you know, I, I, 
I, that, nobody's asking me, obviously, but that's my opinion. I know. Rosaria, tell us what you really think. You've been so, you've been so subtle in this talk. In addition to a Obergefell and Boz talk, we also leave, live downstream from the Orwellian titled Respective Marriage Act. In 2022, it repealed DOMA, which was the Defense of Marriage Act, and 39 Republican senators, the National Association of Evangelicals, and the Coalition of Christian Colleges and Universities all supported it. So I don't travel much. Strangely enough, I do get invited to travel a lot. But if a, the school that wants to invite me as a member of CCCU, I just say, no, you're a heretic. I'm sorry. You're, <laughs> thanks. There are plenty of other heretics out there who will be happy to speak for you. I'm, I can't help you. I can't. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing. These people were not spanked enough as small children, I think. I really do. <laughs> I really do. Behold all of these Christians and so-called conservatives carrying water for the opposing team. You know what I call them? Traitors and cowards. And they're everywhere. They're leading Christianity today. They're writing for the Gospel Coalition. They're everywhere. If anybody here has been praying for me recently and you heard that old song, Breaking Up is Hard to Do in the background, it's because all I've been doing is telling people why I'm not writing for them, why I'm not speaking for them. I, and I'm going to be happy staying home and, and baking cookies, let me just tell you. If all I get to do is speak to true believers for the rest of my days, may, may our tribe increase. Because that's what the gospel wants. It's not here to tickle the ears of people. Not at all. A new and different gospel, a different religion has entered the evangelical church through the codification of Romans 1 and a Burgerfell and Bostock, and it is called gay Christianity. Side A affirms gay marriage and gay sex. Side B embraces gay identity and falsely claims it holds to a biblical sexual ethic. Both side A and B affirm gay people as a category of personhood and support gay pride marches. Both believe that homosexual orientation is ontological and either morally good or morally neutral. Both send the gay is who you are message. Both deny the resurrection has power to change your life. And both side A and B gay Christianity are different religions from the orthodox Christian faith. Gay Christianity represents the contemporary manifestation of neo-orthodoxy, a religion that believes that because man is righteous in himself, the purpose of the Christian faith is to flourish here on earth and not die, take up a cross, and follow Jesus. And there's no total depravity in neo-orthodoxy, just nice people doing their best nice things. And you know what? It is impossible to call people to salvation who already think they are saved. As J. Gresham Machen pointed out 100 years ago, even our Lord did not call the righteous to repentance, and probably we shall be no more successful than he. And this leads to a question you might have, especially you young people. Why does it always seem that the enemies of God outnumber the friends? The Puritan William Plummer helps to explain things. The reason is that an evil cause mortifies no vile affection and requires no self-denial. Campus ministries reluctant to advance biblical truth will have a tough go. I don't often get invited to speak at a PCA church, but when I do, <laughs> RUF boycotts. Oh, well. The Dignitary Harm Clause in Obergefell has launched a war between real Christianity and the idol of the self, fully represented right now in LGBTQ plus ideology, and the front line is the university. And you know what happens in war? Well, a pretty simple thing happens in war. Borders close. Maybe your favorite coffee shop was there one day, and it's just not the next day. Maybe that third way in the middle road that you wanted to always 
reconfigure your gospel message on? Well, newsflash, this is war, and there is no third way, and there is no middle road. It was washed out by a Burgefell. It hasn't been there in a while, but you're not gonna hear evangelical parachurch ministries tell you that. No, 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 they don't want you to know that. They want you to be a soft presence. They say that. Jen Wilkins said that recently in a faith, a good faith debate for Gospel Coalition that was neither good nor faithful, so it needs a new name. But, you know, send your kids. Do what you want with your kids. Just have the, teach them to be a soft presence. Well, I have news for Jen Wilkins. She hasn't noticed. And for the Gospel Coalition, which I shared with them on the phone a few weeks ago, if you want to be a soft presence in Sodom, you're going to end up at best like Lot and more likely apostate. There is no such uh, thing right now as being a soft presence in Sodom. Instead, the gospel leaves you with a singular hope found in Romans 1, 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The codification of Romans 1 exchanges and the Obergefell and Bostock Supreme Court cases have unleashed five lies into this world. And these are lies that the broad evangelical church has pretty much endorsed wholesale. But here's what you also have to know about these lies. These were lies that I once believed. I believed all of them as an unbeliever, but I even held on to some of these as a believer. So I've had to do a lot of public repentance lately, and in this book, on the pages of this book, I do that as well. The first lie is that homosexuality is normal, and homosexual orientation is true and immutable, fixed and never changing. Homosexual orientation, a 19th century Freudian invention, is an unbiblical category of personhood, as we talked about, and it is an antagonist to the creation ordinance because it redefines sinful desires as something that describe who you are rather than a, an indwelling sin against which you must level the gospel. In other words, gay may very well be how you feel, but it will never be who you are. It locates original sin as part of our image bearing. Line number one claims that the word of God doesn't apply to homosexual orientation because homosexual orientation represents a person's core and morally neutral truth. And some professing Christians believe that it is fixed and immutable and part of God's creational and eternal plan. Gay and not God is all of a sudden, according to the broad evangelical church, immutable. Now, one theologian defines God's immutability as that perfection in God whereby he is exalted above all. But if you exchange the creature, if you exchange the creator for the creature, you impose God's attributes on man, and that is what the LGBTQ movement within the evangelical church does. So when we hear homosexual orientation is fixed and immutable, thank you, Greg Johnson, it never changes. This is only imaginable in a world that has already exchanged the worship of the creature, of the creator for the worship of the creature. To exchange an attribute of God for an attribute of man is a high point of idolatry. And that's what you hear. You're gonna hear it. If you start listening for it, you need to tune your ears to this, unfortunately, so you can reject it. It just kind of slipped in like air pollution. Number two, Lie number two, being a spiritual person is kinder than being a biblical Christian. You've probably heard that before. Unbiblical spirit, spirituality welcomes people exactly as they are, or at least makes this promise. This is a religion that elevates being a good person and being at one with the universe. It claims that everything in the universe is one, and distinctions and hierarchies are called abusive. 
unbiblical spirituality, believes that everything in the universe shares a divine power. Notice how pagans are telling you how blessed they are these days. Notice how almost every adjective we used to use as Christians now can be found in a pagan dictionary. That's what I'm talking about. Um, and it is ultimately non-binary insofar as it does not make a distinction between the creator and the creature. But biblical Christianity is binary. Biblical Christianity understands two kinds of reality, God and creation. God is eternal, triune, personal, holy, loving, and separate from creation. But according to spirituality, there are two kinds of people. I'm sorry, according to biblical spirituality, there are two kinds of people, those who love God and those defy God. But according to pagan spirituality, everybody's one. You can have that coexist bumper sticker. Biblical Christianity cannot coexist with paganism. When you read that, you read maybe there's a parachurch ministry that wants to embrace the inclusive gospel of Jesus Christ, and then they impart all the DEI language that's the coexist bumper sticker. That's putting Jesus and Buddha together on the same platform. Well, newsflash, the blood of Christ ransomed you so that you can't go back. Amen. And for the true Christian, even when our feelings are drawing us back and we're having those dark nights of the soul, we can all point to the fact that that bridge that we ran on ran to to get to Jesus, when we look behind us, it's gone. Because union with Christ won't allow it to still be there. You're not swinging between Adam and Jesus. You're owned by a living God. And his faithfulness far exceeds your own. But we need to stop dumbing down the gospel. We can't afford to anymore. Line number three is feminism is good for the world and the church. You've heard this lately. Well, you want to make sure we don't have abusers in the church. We better have women elders and a women, woman pastor. Hey, Rosaria, you're a really good orator. Maybe, you know, it's, let me tell you, the wolves are strong out there. I come from a long line of feminists, and for years, this was a badge of honor to me. My parents were staunch defenders of Planned Parenthood, and although the story came to me under duress, I learned that my maternal grandmother had given herself home abortions because she, quote unquote, lived in the dark and medieval days before abortion was, was legal. That my own mother was almost aborted gave no pause to my family's enthusiasm for the practice. After Christ saved me and claimed me for himself, I was really hoping to find a way to reconcile the gospel with feminism. I mean, after all, I heard people say Jesus was a feminist. It sounded a little strange to me. The word itself is a bit anachronistic, but you know, I, I wanted to pursue this. I was really hoping that Jesus would let me go that route, but I found that I couldn't. I found that feminism takes aim at biblical patriarchy and natural progeny. That is, biblical feminism takes aim at men and babies. And thank you, that baby cried right on cue. <laughs> but the Bible and Jesus do not. The Bible supports biblical patriarchy, not feminism. And my support of biblical patriarchy did not come easily or because I suddenly started to believe that men were good. No man is good. Psalm 53, one through three declares, and Romans 3, 10 restates, none are righteous, no, not one. Because men are evil and not good, I began to understand that we need godly men to protect their families and their churches from the droves of wolves. Now, feminism began in 1792 with Mary, Mary Wollstonecraft's A Vindication of the Rights of Woman. Wollstonecraft wrote this groundbreaking book as she lived as philosopher William Godwin's mistress. And she defined, she was the first feminist who called marriage slavery. But days before she gave birth to her daughter, her daughter would become Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, the author of Frankenstein. Days before she gave birth to her daughter, she caved 
and married Godwin because she didn't want to bring a bastard into the world. Feminism has gone through many waves or movements since 1792, with the most recent wave of feminism so tied to LGBTQ+, that now in 2023, we can't define what a woman is, we can't, define, we can't defend women's sports, we can't, even defi we can't even defend our children in government high school bathrooms. So that's not exact, that's, that's a ship with some holes in it, sisters. So while feminism in the world has really been deposed by transgenderism, everywhere you look, what's really fascinating to me is there's only one place, one cultural movement where feminism is thriving, and that is the broad evangelical church. What does that say? I mean, to me, it says that the broad evangelical church it's like, it's like we're running a marathon, and they're like five miles behind the culture, okay? They're not running against the culture. They're just lagging a little bit behind it. I mean, I, okay, I'm just gonna go on here. I'm gonna stay to the manuscript. I'm gonna stick to the manuscript. When Christians disagree about what the Bible says about feminism or homosexuality or other issues, we find that we are really disagreeing about what the Bible is not just what it says, but what it is. The Bible is inerrant, sufficient, inspired, and complete. And we have to ask ourselves, did Jesus come to fulfill the law or destroy it? Do we even read the Old Testament anymore? I don't think broad evangelicalism does. If you are, as I am, a confessional Christian and a biblical inerrantist, you don't believe that the gospel needs a feminist rescue. You can't. Dethroning King Jesus with feminism leads to immature Christian lives and irresponsible and even heretical biblical interpretations. And you know what? You can't dethrone King Jesus anyway. Amen. We need to face the facts. Either you will have a biblical patriarchy or a transgender patriarchy. We will either have godly men leading the church in the world or the patriarchy that comes from drag queen story hour. Which do you want? Line number four, transgenderism is normal for some people, even children apparently. People who believe in what is called gender fluidity believe that sexual difference has no biological or ontological reality. Transgenderism maintains that there are more than two biological sexes and even more genders. The year 2023 currently boasts 72 genders and 78 gender pronouns, and this number will likely go up before I finish this lecture, because <laughs> it has to. We know that a small percentage of people are born sexually indeterminate. And some of these people will receive a medical diagnosis of gender dysphoria or intersex condition. But medical an an anomalies do not negate objective categories of personhood. That we are all born with sin, both natural and moral, due to the fall, does not redefine the creational order that God calls good. While gender, dys while gender dysphoria is a medical illness, transgenderism is a political ideology. But man's sin does not negate God's rescue. If someone tries to medically reverse God's handiwork and later after this tragic decision becomes saved by the blood of Christ, when his glorified body is resurrected in the New Jerusalem, it will have no trace of genital mutilation. A body glorified by God mocks the mutilation of men. The gospel of Jesus Christ may be most beautiful to detransitioners who have a promise and understand that promise in a way that we probably don't. At this point, you might be inquiring about the fiction writers and thinkers popular among broad evangelicals leading on these subjects today. I mean, where's the Gospel Coalition? You know, where are these guys? What are they doing? How are, you know, how are they managing all this information that I, I seem to be so alarmed about that no one else is alarmed about? Um, you know, I, is this being recorded? It is being recorded. Okay, I'm going to tell you a little secret, but I won't, I won't talk about it because, you know. Talk to me after class. 
Okay, well, here's where these broad event. I'm still going to name names. That's I'm, it, these these broad evangelicals want to be a soft presence here in Sodom. They are quiet and gentle, and they blend in so well to the culture that you don't even know they have a savior. Most have drunk from the fountain of postmodernism, where they only know how to answer a question with more questions. They cede or yield the moral language to the left and refuse to articulate that the Bible itself, you know, has a moral language that can actually save us. Take, for example, Preston Sprinkles in his popular book, Embodied, Transgender Identities, The Church and What the Bible Has to Say. One of my most ridiculous books I've had to read recently. Sprinkles says this, some say transgenderism and intersex condition are caused by the fall. And this man puts the fall in scare quotes. He says they're caused by the fall. Why do we use scare quotes? Why do you, to, to say something isn't real. Who believes the fall isn't real? Well, heretic. Okay, but let's go on. Let me, let me not be so picky, Miss English Professor. Others think that they were part of God's original pre-fall design. Here's the clincher. I wasn't in the garden before Adam and Eve sinned, says Preston Sprinkle. And if I'm honest, I know less about the fall and its impact on humanity than I thought I did. Maybe the fall caused a defect in an enzyme that leads to an excessive production of androgens in genetic XX females. Like there's some other kind of females other than genetic XX females, right? Which leads to congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Or, or maybe it was because a dude cheated on his wife and left her when she was eight weeks pregnant, causing all kinds of stress on the mother, which may have caused a defect in the enzyme. Or maybe using the fall to explain transgender and intersex conditions is wrong-headed to begin with, as many disability theologians have reminded us. Oh, we could be here for three hours on this one paragraph, but we won't. Just note a few things about Sprinkle's reasoning. Number one, the book's subtitle promises to tell us what the Bible has to say on issues of transgenderism, but throughout the book, he dodges the Bible and what it has to say and dismisses those of us who can answer the question biblically. Would be anybody, that would be anybody with a sixth grade education who could read Genesis 1 and 2. All right? The perspicuity of, of Scripture is a foundational understanding of the reformers. The Bible is clear, but not to these really smart guys. And then he's got to put the whole doctrine of the fallen scare quotes, which only heretics do. Number two, I mean, seriously. Number two, he fails to footnote who all these disability theologians are who are wiser than the Bible. Well, who are they? I've never even heard of one. Uh, number three, he tells us because he wasn't in the garden at the time of the fall, he can't really know what happened. Perhaps this explains the scare quotes. I mean, I'm supposed to believe that P Preston Sprinkle's point of view is wiser than God's? And if only Preston Sprinkle were in the garden, we would have a legitimate witness to the truth? I mean, this is many things. Gnostic postmodernism would be the category of literature you would put it in if you wanted to know where to find this. But it's certainly not biblical faith. Why, you may be wondering, did the Gospel Coalition give it a thumbs up review? And this would be after I call to complain. Okay, it's not like I sit quietly. I, I, people have different opinions, Rosaria. Yes, I'm sure they do, and I'd like to know why the wolves get to have such a mouthpiece in broad evangelicalism. You know, Eve, the sin in the garden was not that Eve and Adam told a lie. It was Satan who told a lie. It's that they believed a lie. You want to see a, a real revival, a real reformation in our churches? Then please know if your pastor sounds like this, you need to flee. And you need to find a church where you can be shepherded well. 
Okay, you can't change the church from the pews. But if we Christian women remain faithful and we aren't afraid to say, you're a wolf, get behind me, Satan, and stay there, we're going to see a lot of change. And God will be glorified. So what does this all mean? How did we get to a place in the United States where a young girl can walk into Planned Parenthood and 45 minutes later leave with a prescription for test testosterone that will leave her feeling great at first, but after a few more hits, sterilized and battling incontinence? Well, we got here by believing the lie that transgenderism is normal, at least for some people. False teachers in the churches and parachurch ministries they lead extend that lie by defending the right of quote unquote trans Christians. The idea that transgenderism reflects a normal gender variant builds upon the feminist separation between sex and gender. And born again Christians defy this psychological distinction. As Pastor Christopher Gordon writes, God established a natural order in the creation of male and female that is good for us as image bearers of God to introduce gender as a new category of personhood, separate from the biological category of sex in pursuit of a different sexual identity is unnatural to the creation order and harmful to the purpose for which God made us. Christians should note the irony here. The very principle that enlarged feminism's scope simultaneously created its demise. That's part of how God brings down nations. You're watching it before your very eyes. And the fifth lie is that modesty is an outdated virtue and contributes to the victimization of women. I know you've all heard this. And I imagine, especially in Miami, this is a tough one. But I'll just plunge forward. Having denied that men and women are different with different responsibilities, callings, and boundaries, those who reject modesty believe that calling women to a different standard of dress, speech, and conduct is oppressive. They deny that women owe their brothers the kindness of modesty, and that men owe their sisters the dignity of protecting their reputations. And at the bottom of this is the feminist belief that it is not fair that women are different from men, and that asking women to dress and behave with biblical modesty serves male dominance and holds women back. In the contemporary church climate, modesty has been almost uh, completely replaced, at least in broad evangelicalism, by exhibitionism, especially on social media. I used to believe and defend all of these lies, but I don't anymore. And furthermore, I believed and defended these lies publicly, not privately. Public sins, especially from public figures, demand public repentance, repentance not just course correction. And my repentance is public and on the record, and I share it with you in public lectures and in blogs and in my forthcoming book. I was wrong at, on all of this at some point in my life, so I get it. I understand the deceptiveness of sin. Being deceived by sin is like being taken captive by an evil force to do its bidding. And you know what? When you are deceived by sin, you aren't faking it. You can't see it any other way. That's why the rest of us should not be asking people how they feel, but rather throwing the rope of the gospel. Amen. You know, sometimes you just need to tell a drowning person, just grab on to this. We no longer, um, we can no longer be a compromising soft presence. We must conf confront lies. And to confront something is not to reject it out of hand or to misrepresent it. Instead, a confrontation is an act of respect. It requires us to take the side of the Bible's witness and to embrace Christ's point of view over and against anything and anyone that offers a different gospel. Your witness for Christ ultimately requires that you know Christ better than you know the world. And this means that you are in the Bible more than you are on the internet. A confrontation finally concludes with accepting or rejecting a position and encouraging other people to do the same. It's not just enough to be a little island unto yourself. 
you're supposed to persuade people. Our method for confrontation is found in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. Though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have the divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Unconfronted lies have made a big mess for us because lies cannot be tamed. Lies do not coexist with truth, but rather they corrupt it. The evangelical church has swapped the biblical mandate of godly confrontation for godless, spineless compromise. The Bible calls us to know our enemy and then respond biblically. And you know what that looks like? It looks like loving your enemies. You know, last year I talked with a Christian grandmother whose lesbian identifying daughter decided to raise her three-year-old son as a girl in the name of saving the world from toxic masculinity. She even bought him that Target underwear, Tuck Buddies. I mean, I don't know where your three-year-old boys were when you were potty training them, but man, I, that's abusive. That is abusive on, the, on all of it. This Christian grandmother was angry, terrified, and lives in a state that protects LGBTQ plus lies. And the daughter who identifies as lesbian has leveled charges that the church placed heavy burdens upon her as a gay person. Well, what were those burdens? The burdens of gospel obedience. She and her partner were not allowed to take the vows of covenant membership and remain in their sin, and thus they felt excluded. Furthermore, she saw no evidence that gay people, in, in, I'll put that in scare quotes, were reflected in leadership in the church. She charged the church with spiritual abuse. This is a real story, and it comes with real questions. Is being offended by the gospel spiritual abuse? And if so, does victim status mean that you're not a sinner? I mean, can't you be a sinner and a victim at the same time? Aren't we all at some point? If you've been victimized, I mean, I'm sure you also have seen your sin. I don't mean necessarily in that particular act of victimization, but in your, your sin nature. And what about the actual abuse that this woman's son is enduring at her hands with the support of the civil magistrate? And this raises another question. Let's say this woman is your neighbor. Let's make it closer. Let's say this woman is your daughter. Can you as a Christian be friends with her? Are you supposed to be friends with her? Does God call you to friendship with his enemies? Matthew 10, 16 says, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of the wolves. Be wise as serpents, innocent as doves. Our Lord does not call you to be reciprocal friends with the enemy. You are to be friendly, and you want to be their friend, but they are not your friends. Enemies of Christ are your enemy, even if it's somebody you love. But here's the rub. You are called to something higher and harder than fake friendship. You are called to love your enemies. Facing the fact that I was Christ's enemy was a powerful milestone in my Christian life. I was at Pastor Ken Smith's table, having shared another meal with my Christian neighbors, and I thought that these people, nice as they were, were my enemies. They didn't support gay rights. They didn't approve of my homosexuality. And after dinner, one of the children at the table put a book in my hands, the Psalter, and I was to open it to Psalm 23, Selection B, and we were to sing. All of a sudden, the room rang out in four-part harmony. The song goes like this. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want he like the 
the idea of Jesus, but at this point, I really wanted to be a lesbian. My soul he doth restore again, and me to walk doth make within the paths of righteousness, even for his own name's sake. This stanza made me uncomfortable. Anytime the Bible talked about righteousness, I knew I was on shaky ground. And I never liked thinking about my soul. Yea, though I walk in death's dark veil, yet will I feel no ill for the staff me comfort still. I wanted Jesus as my equal, not Jesus my authority. I didn't want any rod and I didn't want any staff. I wanted affirmation, not correction. A table thou hast furnished me in presence of my foes. My head thou dost with oil anoint, and my cup overflows. This stanza brought me to a full stop. A, a table thou hast furnished me in presence of my foes. Have you ever read a book and realized that you were reading it all along from the wrong point of view? Well, that's what happened to me when I was singing that stanza. A table thou hast furnished me in presence of my foes. I thought I was dining in the presence of my enemies, you know, these bigots whose food I was consuming and who didn't approve of my homosexuality. Discernment came like a tractor beam in the night. They weren't my enemies, but I was theirs. I was Christ's enemy, and I was my Christian neighbor's enemy. And yet they loved me enough to seat me at their table and tell me the truth. They were not my enemy, but I was theirs. Goodness and mercy all my life shall surely follow me. And in God's house, Forevermore, my dwelling place shall be. I sang that last line as an alien, enemy, and a stranger, as an outsider looking in. There is a blessing there, and I didn't get it. I wasn't in grace. That last line, which you see on samplers and coffee mugs, those were lines of rebuke to me. They told me that there is a promise out there, and it was not mine, not yet, and I knew it. And over the course of the next year, my enemy status impelled me to grasp hold of Christ and beg him for forgiveness, restoration, and protection. It took a year of fighting that one out. I begged him to change me at the core and to orient every fiber of my being towards surrender. And the following year, after many tears and continued repentance, I committed my life to Jesus and I took the vows of church membership. Praise be 
to God. Yeah. All the glory goes to God. All the complaints go to me. That's the way it always goes. But I want you to see how rigorous this was. These were not happy, clappy songs. Nobody, nobody just jollied me into the, the kingdom. So to return to your fictional sister's question from the beginning of this talk, why are enemy lines drawn within Christianity on issues that the Bible speaks so clearly about, like homosexuality, feminism, paganism, transgenderism, and the ontological difference between men and women? Why? Why is there a civil war raging between broad, raging within broad evangelicalism? Three reasons, five lies. Dear Christians, Know the reasons and defy the lies. Do not believe yourselves to be more merciful than God. If you do, you are in sin and must repent. It is certainly a sin to tell lies, but it is also a sin to believe them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, no questions? No, no oh. we'll do that at the, at the Oh, the very end. Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. I don't know the rules. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't have a... You don't have to abide by rules. Don't just do I just do. Said it. Did you not hear I what you said? I do, I do, I need to. <laughs> I heard, I, I listened, I promise. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much, Rosaria. Thank you, thank you. Another...